what I'm going to talk to you today about is um, how the church has been manipulated with techniques of undue influence and spiritual abuse um, to accept the complementarian doctrine. And we've been bullied and strong-armed into doing it. And it, it is not a gen it's disingenuous. It's a disingenuous term and we're being manipulated. Undue influence is a term of jurisprudence that um, describes um, inequitable balances of power and abuse that takes place um, because of that ab abuse of power. And I believe that without the techniques that are used to promote this doctrine, that most people would reject it, or they at least would have some, something to say about it. They would be much more critical about it. So I'm going to teach you some of the techniques that they use. All right, well, first of all, the traditions, I, the problems that I have with complementarianism, um, they have distorted the truth. And that is putting it lightly. Uh, there's doctrinal issues that I have difficulty with. Um, and I, I just, I can't even begin to do that subject justice, I'm sure. The other speakers will begin to uh, enlighten you about that. Jocelyn Anderson's book, Woman, This is War, is an excellent resource to go through and find out the distorted truths that are told. And, as I said, I believe the church has been denied informed consent because of the use of the techniques of undue influence and thought reform to bypass people's critical thinking skills to lull them to sleep. And I believe that this uh, movement is not really about the, the teaching of the Word of God, but it has more to do with the gaining and maintaining of power. And it's a system of hegemony. Now, um, theories of undue influence, basically what I'm going to do is give you tools to help you identify, explain, and qualify subjective behavior about manipulation. And what is manipulation? It's the works of the flesh. And I believe that Jesus used parables in this very way to describe these things. I'm just going to use models and theories because that's how, that <laughs> that's what we do um, today. But Jesus used parables. Michaela. Thanks, that's okay. Um, now, this influence is subtle and crafty. Who was the first example of subtle and crafty in the Bible? It was a snake. Snakes avoid direct conflict. They, they don't want to engage you. If a snake wants to gain entry into your house, it doesn't come knocking at your door and says, let me in. It sneaks into cracks in the foundation. It disguises itself as something else. It slides into something else. And you carry it willingly into your home, not identifying it as something dangerous. Now, everyone is vulnerable to this influence. And we all have human nature, we all have emotions, we all have behaviors, we all have things that can be manipulated. We get tired, we get stressed, we get depressed. And these things all work against us um, when someone is trying to manipulate us. Stress and major life transitions are very powerful. And also, if you are in a state of dire need and someone comes along with a ready-made solution that's going to solve all your problems, you're not going to be as willing to scrutinize that solution as you would be if you weren't under, um, under distress or if you didn't have that need. Michaela, I need the next. Okay, now um, everyone's vulnerable to this. What happens to you when you get um, distracted um, and these techniques are used on you? Basically, the whole idea is to keep the target off balance. We want to um, get people a little bit off balance, you know, think, gee, am I okay? Um, get people emotionally engaged. You know, if you're standing straight and solid on your feet, you're hard to knock over. If you're standing on one foot, it's a little easier. What this does when people use these techniques, if they overwhelm you with information, if they give you confusing information that doesn't seem to make sense, and they give you several ideas that are confusing in rapid succession, which is often done with some of our theologians and academicians, um, you slip into a very passive state. You're all being good Bereans. I can tell by your body posture, 
your eye contact, and if I could go around the room and do physical assessment, I could g give you physiologic data that would tell me that you're, in, you're being good Bereans. Your brain waves are cranking along at about 15 hertz per second. You're thinking. What these techniques do when you get thrown uh, too much information, confusing information, ambiguous information, it literally slows your brain waves down. You go into an alpha state. This is the ideal state for hypnosis. And they, you can do it through emotions, you can do it intellectually through too much confusing information. So if you want to say it that way, they're literally putting you to sleep. They're putting your critical thinking to sleep. Um, and I think it deserves to be said that some people just learn this organically. I think there are probably preachers that get up and say, I'm going to do this, this, and this to manipulate my congregation. But I think a good minister learns what works with their congregation. Okay. Now, I just threw this in. This is a physiologic thing. I am not talking about psychobabble. This is an EEG. It records the electricity generated by the brain. We can observe this clinically. So that's all I need to say <laughs> about that. But there's plenty more of this on my website. And if you go to undermuchgrace.com, there's all kinds of links and more reading there than you probably care to be interested in. Now, biblical support. Is this biblical? Well, Walter Martin, who wrote The Kingdom of the Cults, the landmark book, said that there are two types of fruit in the life of the believer. The fruit of the life lived and the fruit of the doctrine preached. We need both. This tends to go along with the approach to cults. There are cults of theology that generally deny the um, deity of Christ. And we have a problem with that in complementarianism, too. So I don't have as much of a problem uh, calling them cultic. However, um, a group can just go through and use behaviors that are manipulative and be considered cultic in terms of, um, in terms of uh, just the behavior and social psychology. Okay. Now, when, next slide. <laughs> my, my remote's not working. Okay, what does the Bible tell us about spiritual abusers? Now, most Christians confront people regarding doctrine. It's not proper to confront anybody. And uh, the next four, give me four clicks there. My assistant, all right, 47% of the verses that deal with false prophets, false teachers, and Pharisees have to do with behavior. 31% concern fruit. 12% 12 12 concern motive. 10% deal with doctrine. If we are going to confront cultic behavior in the church and manipulation, and we only are allowed to talk about doctrine, are we doing what the Bible tells us to do? Absolutely not. I don't think so. Now, um, models and theories of undue influence. Basically, I'm going to describe for you and give you the tools to understand how manipulation works. When you go into a new church and you want to find out whether you want to attend there, what's the first thing a good Christian, good Berean does? They go over and they pull the doctrinal statement. You are only getting a very small amount of information with this because there are written rules and there are unwritten rules in a group. Complementarianism is generally one of the unwritten rules. The church I attended, had they come out and told me, women cannot teach. Um, women cannot speak the word in power because it's not womanly. Uh, we would have turned and we would have run. We would have run from that place. But it wasn't revealed to us uh, directly. We were not given informed consent about the beliefs of the group. So you have to observe how a group behaves. Paul said, I'll show you my faith by my works. And we need to look for that as Christians. Now, I also, I do not have time to give this subject justice, and there's a video on my uh, blog by Dr. Philip Zimbardo. He is a social psychologist, and he talks about the, I think every Christian should review his material. He's written a book called The Lucifer Effect, Why, Why Good People Do Bad Things. And um, basically, the system that's set up, and the system within, that people function within, basically predisposes them to be evil, and I believe complementarianism does that very well. 
unfortunately. <laughs> but he talks about social proof and pressure, and these are very potent and powerful things for anyone, even a Christian. And we know the word of God, but we are, are also human beings, and we can be influenced. Um, you know, the camaraderie we have here today, the worshiping together, it is a, a potent, powerful thing. And this comes into play, and he reviews that. So I'm going to refer you to him for that, and it is a huge topic. All right, one of the first models I'd like to look at, it's Steve's Hassan model. We are individuals um, by way of our thoughts, emotions, and behavior. That's how we display our individuality. We have discrete thoughts, we have different behaviors, we have different emotions. We all have these things. We are consistent as human beings, and we like to have all these things working together in concert with one another. So if, say if you're depressed and somebody says to you, you know what, you need to go out and do something fun. Well, that is because the behavior will pull the emotion and will change your emotion. If you have lousy thoughts and you're depressed, what does a Christian do? They go to the Word and they bring every thought captive and they do spiritual warfare. And it has an effect on emotion and behavior. It is tremendously difficult, nearly impossible, to resist influence like this. Shame through emotion is huge. Everybody, every human being has a little bit of shame. We're not perfect. We want to be like God. We want to be perfect. We want to be in control and we can't. And that leads to shame. And so every human being has a little bit of shame. Some people have more shame than others, depending on their background. And if you have unfinished emotional, emotions, emotional business, it becomes very difficult to resist this. Now, you walk into a group, if, I, if you go into a car dealer and you're looking around and you like the cars and the salesman comes up to you, what do they want you to do? They want you to give them your phone number and they want you to get in the car and test drive the car. Why? They know that if you touch that product where if they can secure your behavioral compliance, they've almost been guaranteed to sell you a car. And if you don't buy it from him, you'll probably buy it from somebody else very soon because behavior influences us. All right, on the next, uh, now Steve also adds in here, Steve Hassan, he adds information into this. And he's, because we base our thoughts, emotions, and behavior on information, if you can control the information a person receives. This is as powerful as controlling the emotion, the thought, or behavior.